Hello, I'm Rick Vanover. Yeah. And in this segment, I'm going to introduce a technology to you called the Scale Out Backup Repository. This is something that's not new, but it's actually really important. And we thought for each of you, as we've researched your backgrounds, it might be really interesting. So as I look at the Scale Out Backup Repository, there are a number of things I want to cover. I want to give you some definitions, right? You know, we've made up that word. But as I back into the definitions, it'll make some sense. I'm going to introduce two tiers. So I, I mentioned software defined earlier. The performance tier and the capacity tier are elements of that software definition of what we're doing in here. <clears throat> and then we're going to go into a couple of other examples about it. So first thing I want to say is what is a backup repository? So this is where Veeam puts its backups. Quite simply, if we are that trusted provider of cloud data management solutions for backups, we have to put our backup data somewhere. Veeam's 100% software also. We don't, we don't sell blinky lights. We partner with all of the blinky lights. But the thought is we have to put the data somewhere. We are that data mover. And it can be the traditional types of storage, direct attached storage, some cloud object storage, deduplication appliances, network attached storage. Uh, we have a service provider technology where we can put backup data as well. Chances are anywhere you want to put your data, Veeam can find a way. Now, Does tape, it not to see tape on there? <laughs> yeah, tape is a target we can do, but it's not officially a backup repository. So good question there, uh, Chris, for sure. Tape or uh, NDMP as well are kind of standards-based uh, targets we can do. But we don't call that a repository. That's more of a, well, we just call it tape. But there's, there's, there's one or two like industry standard storage protocols that were made <laughs> by our competitors that we don't write to, obviously. But other than that, chances are we can put backup data anywhere. And the thought here is a scale out backup repository. Well, that's kind of a meta concept. It's a logical construct of multiple underlying storages, which I call extents, which we just defined as a logical entity. right? So it's like a target abstracting the under underlying storages. So it is really a software defined play where Veeam is like this management layer, <coughs> software-defined storage provider of these underlying backup storages. So the scale-out part is managed at the server level and not at the repository level. A absolutely. It's managed at the Veeam server level. And it's relatively low overhead to do that. But the underlying storages, that's where we will send that backup data. And the beautiful thing is we can add and remove elements of it underlying to the parent scale-out backup repository with relative ease. Now, when I take a look at, OK, I've got some words and I've got some ideas of storages. How do I put that in pictures? And Anthony will demo some of these in just a second. So if I were to examine a scale-out backup repository, that, to me, as a Veeam user, is where I put my backup jobs. And it would be backed or built upon, in this case, three different storage resources, and I've intentionally mixed it up. Direct attached storage, network attached storage, and a deduplication appliance. You can do more than three. You can do multiple types. I had one organization take all of their local storage and pull it together. It was actually an inter interesting idea. Who's dedupe appliance? You don't sell blinky lights. Um, we have direct integrations with Exagrid, HPE Store Once, Quantum DXI, Dell EMC Data Domain, and I think that's about all of them. Those are direct integrations. And then if the others are standards based, <coughs> like uh, SMB protocol or NFS, we can get into it that way as well. But those first four have like a joint, everything from fully integrated to a little bit better integration and native data movers and stuff like that. But anyways, this is a logical collection of these. But we can actually do some amazing things. Like I can say things like, I only want to put my full backups on the dedupe appliance because I'm going to get better storage efficiency. And I want to put my increments on the others for better performance. I have those types of policies that I can do. But when I run the backup jobs, which ma what is magical here is that the backup jobs just target the actual scale out backup repository. And then the lack of a better word, we don't call it a policy engine. But the policy definition will actually say where these data files go. I've just randomly distributed them evenly, but it also can be a thing where if one of them's not available, the backups will go to the remaining, which is actually really important so you won't miss, miss your backup window. So that's the scale-out backup repository. 
And that's what we call the performance tier, because you have a very granular performance policy you can set up. A lot of logic on that. That's what we've had for a number of years. And then earlier this year, we implemented this thing called a capacity tier, or the cloud tier. We go back and forth on the name. Yeah, Sorry, Rick. Um, on the previous slide, just yeah. um, that idea of being able to push backups to different um, types of technology. Yeah. Um, other than you knowing, is there any way that you can determine how one performs over another? So, for instance, you might push a certain type of data to one platform because the network capacity is faster. Mm -hmm. You know you'll get the backup done quicker, mm -hmm. and you might choose to move it around later. Or you might find that the DGIP engine is is slow at taking a certain type of backup, and that might you know you could you could yeah. get feedback from the system to see that. Or do you have to do that manually? No. Well, you can do it manually, but that would not be the right thing to do. Uh, the right thing to do would be using our Veeam 1 product because it will actually tell you how busy each of these underlying extents are uh, in terms of how many hours they're processing, how much jobs are going to them. So you can actually look and determine, is there balance? Is there not? You can look and determine, is there uh, the right amount of time used, like match that to a backup window? So the visibility aspect is sorted by Veeam 1 for sure, the data protection view. But anyways, these tiers, good question, Chris, the cloud tier or the capacity tier, this is the angle for the modern era. So I like to say that getting on-premises storage is not a problem. Getting the money for on-premises storage sometimes can be a problem. So in 2019 and 2020 and beyond, one of the things I want to do is be able to leverage the cloud, right? So that's where this capacity tier or the cloud tier came in. And the thought here is I can take what I just explained to you and back it into the cloud, make it infinite. Because those three extents, they might fill up, but there's some considerations. For one, the thought is I want to put data that's outside of my normal restores, potentially in the cloud. But I also want to think about what actually happens to that data. I have a visualization that will show you what happens to it. But the thought is this, this policy in place for moving data to the cloud will actually decouple the actual backup data from the metadata, which is very interesting. This will also implement a mechanism where the performance tier, that on-premises repository of, of your backup data, will have very good indexing or cataloging of what is in the, the Veeam console, wherever it is. Meaning, I only care about the data I have. If it's on-premises or if it's in the cloud, I really just want to be able to restore it. So there's some very intelligent, very intelligent aspects to that. And then on top of that, we can, again, I use this word infinite. Any mathematicians in the room? Because I got a little feedback when I started using that because somebody argued with me that the cloud is not infinite, but for most customers it effectively is. But anyways, the thought here is that if I can take that construct of the scale-out backup repository, make it effectively infinite in the cloud, keep that software-defined angle, keep that single pane of glass, I can do some amazing things. That's what we introduced earlier this year, Cloud Field Day 5. We, Anthony did a great dive on that. But there's one consideration that came up from that, and it is that it somewhat goes against a recommendation we've had for years of this 3-2-1 rule, having three different copies of media on two different, uh, sorry, three different copies of data on two different media, with one of those being off-site. Now, that's a beautiful logic. It can address nearly any failure scenario, and it doesn't require any specific technology. But as we look at the cloud tier, just moving the data off-site doesn't really align to that. So. Anthony will show this technology here in a second. But what we've done with the cloud tier is take what I've just described, the performance tier of the scale-out backup repository, and then these oldest backups, right? The content that doesn't align to the most recent restore windows, because over here, you're going to get really good performance. You're going to get fast restores, fast incremental backups, and then quote unquote going deep in the cloud, if I move the older backups over there, whether it's Amazon S3 compatible, Amazon S3 in the public cloud, Azure Blob or IBM storage, we can get some really good long-term retention in the cloud and actually you can still use it very well as, as well. So that being said, this is what we have today, which is rather awesome. And what we do with that metadata coupled with the regular data is we simply decouple it. 
So this VBK file is where we put our backups on those repositories. And when we look at the cloud, we'll actually take the oldest backup data and the metadata to the cloud. And so what was a block on premises is now an object or a page in the cloud. And it's a transparent shelling of this file straight to the cloud. The most important thing, no cloud tax. You can use the cloud with no additional Veeam cost to do this, to have longer term retention. Another way. So there's no licenses for Veeam in the cloud at correct. this point. Because the only thing I'm sending is blocks or chunks of data that just need to be stored. I'm just correct. using the cloud as an infinite hard disk. Absolutely. Log logically. And, you know. Right. With uh, the object storage being that kind of expansible target without any Veeam cost. We, you have to provide your own Veeam or your own cloud account. Can I have with two clouds or two object servers, one local and one, uh, you know, two copies? <coughs> on two object servers. I mean, one not currently with one scale out backup repository. You could you could copy from one scale out backup repository in Amazon to Azure that way, but you you you'd have uh, that wouldn't it, it ideally be ideal. Could you restore if you did that? If you oh, copied from one to the other, you could yep. restore with the same. It's, it's very transparent to us. It's a restore point, whether it lies here, there, <coughs> or there. We don't care, and that rhymes. But what happens if I make a copy? I mean, if I have an object store and every object I get, every modification I get on an object store is replicated to a second object store, is the, is the information always consistent on the secondary copy? So we have a lot of interest around multiple cloud targets, but we don't have that set currently with one scale out repository. Let me think about that because I want to think about the usability and one of the things we are very intelligent about is egress. So, and that leads me to this before I turn it over to Anthony. When we put data into the cloud, you'll notice the metadata goes first and then we'll take these actually, what were data blocks on premises, now pages or objects in the cloud. And then on premises, we'll actually contract to just a few megabytes of metadata only. The magic here is that the metadata, which exists in both places, will quickly point to me where I need to go to drive my restores or subsequent backups. So we've actually implemented a storage efficiency in the cloud, which Anthony will talk about more in a second. But that is what is there today, and this is a very important set of technology for people to use the cloud. Rick, um, two questions for you. Mm -hmm. What size are the blocks that are going into the cloud? One meg. One meg. And, um, and obviously, bearing in mind that this is a subscription service in the cloud, clearly one of the things you want to be very careful of is not having data there that you shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. So you could imagine a scenario where, um, for whatever reason, the mapping between the metadata and the data can become disjointed, disconnected, corrupted. Uh, so Anthony's uh, going gonna to cover scenarios right. of, of that problem. Yes, that's a very big risk, and it, we've got a four plus point check that he's going to go over. Okay. Also, as well, just to your previous point on the block size, it actually depends on what you configure in the theme job. So block is 1,024, we then compress that by about 50%, which makes it 512. But then we've got as small as 256 all the way to 4096. So it really depends. The smaller the block, obviously the more transactions you're going to be doing and the more operations, the larger the less. But, but, if, it's, um, but if it's larger blocks, then when you try to expire data that's old, you have to be very careful that you haven't got data that's from multiple sources and you can't expire blocks. That's where the metadata comes in, because we'll know we need this, and actually that's really important in the immutability part that Anthony's yeah. going to get Yeah, we'll get to that, yeah. Okay. Good question. So a couple other resources for this particular set of technology, uh, including what we did at Cloud Field Day 5, but I wanted to really set up the cloud tier, or sorry, the uh, capacity tier and the cloud tier, as well as the whole scale-up backup repository, because what Anthony's going to talk about in the next segment will make a heck of a lot more sense.